So the last thing we might look at in understanding the academic record is uh, processes. I keep wanting to say process. I've heard Terry so much. Um, but processes is what we'll look at next. And this is the area that's probably the most refined. Um, if you've looked through any of the documentation beforehand. And we've put together a series of user stories, and these are primarily a, a central administrator focused user stories, which makes sense. These are typically the actors that are interacting in a direct basis with this information. And I'll kind of just walk through these a little bit to see if you're familiar with them. Um, of course, we have entering or changing a grade on a course. This is a little different than, say, through the grade submission model, because we all know instructors usually give certain windows for them to make corrections to their grades being submitted, but this is really dealing with, you know, that piece that there's super user access to always be able to go to an academic record for any year. I can go back to 1903 and change a grade. You know, instructors don't have that access. Um, adding, dropping, modifying, all these kind of management kinds of cruddy things, uh, of course, on an academic record. So these are things that a registrar and a central admin needs to be able to accomplish in any term. Um, adjusting the way the course is consumed. So we talked about this before. There's different ways that we tweak things. Um, in terms of, I spoke before about undergraduate and graduate GPA differences and where you might target something. Um, I think Maryland might be a little bit unique in that we also perform a variety of other kinds of GPA tweaks to a course in terms of something we call academic clemency that some institutions have, um, where, you know, after a separation of, I forget what it was, I think it's five years? Um, if you come back to the institution and plead, you know, I was an idiot back then, I'm a new changed person, uh, don't hold me accountable for my idiot days, we'll go back and actually remove courses from your calculations. They'll still always show, we won't change that, but we'll change how it calculates into your GPA and pull them out. And we have a couple other kinds of policies that work like that to help support students who left under bad situations. Um, I'll start, I could talk all day about those things too, but I know I'll probably bore you if I talk about this. Um, we have manually posting degrees. Obviously, you're going to have your graduation site, which knows how to take the clearances and post those to the record. But we also have do manual posting of degrees as well. That's a feature and a process that we need to have supported, um, especially when you think about building old records. So you might build an old record from the 50s in your current system. I need to be able to pop a degree on there. I'm not going to go through a clearance system to do it. I need to just post the degree on the record. Um, Free-form comments. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that you might need to do that for, either in current situations in terms of certain recognitions that you might want to put that aren't codified, that you might just need to say, I just need to get that documented on that academic record. Um, it's particularly useful when you're working with old records. Um, managing a term record for a student. So for many institutions, you actually record a, kind of a snapshot of the student's term on the academic record. So it might be for the fall term, you're going to capture that, oh, in that term, they were a full-time student, they were a resident of the, of, uh, the state of Maryland. Um, they were in this particular program. They were a grad assistant, so that changed their full-time, part-time staff. I mean, they have all these things that you might capture that gives you a kind of reflection of what happened in that term. Um, and of course, the last one, you need to be able to create a new academic record from students who kind of were before your system. And uh, though especially big institutions have been around for a while, this is an every week occurrence that you find yourself in a position to have to go back to either an old system or I've had to go back to the archive files that pull a yellow record out and you have to build that into your new system. Um, either because you have a student returning, which we have a lot of um, students who are kind of in retirement phase but have interest to come back and just and continue their education. So we've got to go build the record again, so we have to build that in the new system. Um, and the process by which you build a record from scratch is very different than how you would normally manage a current student who's coming in and where your system's been built with its processes to build that and fill that information in. Some other central admin user stories related to this area deal with recording transfer course information with the grades and units. And this comes the source data, you know, what's the information from that institution that we need to record in our system. Um, also, recording and monitoring who's accessed a student's record. So for most institutions, this is actually pretty important to do. Certain populations you might look at closer than others, but you typically track who's been looking at a record um, for different kinds of security reasons. Um, but in particular, at Maryland, we have very high level active monitoring. You know, we have passive monitoring and active monitoring. We have active monitoring of 
different types of either celebrities or athletes. I'm sure USC has this problem too with celebrities you might show up. Um, our biggest problem has been athletes. So when our teams have had years where they're very good, everybody and their mother wants to go pull them up. So an advisor might, I'm just going to look up the public record of this student. <laughs> you can't use your access to our system to look up the guy you just saw playing basketball last night. So if you guys know Jen Riggs from some of our subject matter expert work we've done, her job was to go call these people and chew them out and remove their access from the system. So we could be quite mean about it. But this also applies to our internal staff. Um, I would say for registrars, if it's an external person, um, we threaten to remove their access to the system, which basically means you have no job anymore. Um, but typically we go to the, you know, the dean or the assistant dean and have them take action as the person's manager. Um, but in that, it can sometimes be soft slaps. Um, registrar's office is nothing of the sort. We've had cases where we found somebody looking at a record they shouldn't have looked at because they saw something interesting on TV the night before. They're just fired. So we're pretty serious about it. Um, not so serious with everybody else, but we, we at least take responsibility for ourselves. The other big important thing is looking at the manual changes to a student's record. So I was talking a little bit about foreign stewardship when we're talking about audit. So we need, you know, it's important that we have features in here which allow us means to really look at every change that's happened and means that we can kind of review and make sure those are accurate. So I don't know if that helps clarify what the academic record is. I'm sure you walk away going, oh, it's a little muddy. And uh, that's understood. Um, there's a lot of work still to be done in kind of bringing that together. So I found a good segue that had off-road tires. So it's fine for the mud. So let's play with some other pieces that might help. Um, you know, we talked about concepts, and we started to get some processes, which started to show some kind of clear user stories that you could look at, relate to, make decisions about. Um, the other thing that we've spent some time on is learning result calculations. And I think it's worth talking a little bit about those. Um, first, just to make sure that we recognize what they are and how we use them. But second, also to talk a little bit about the vocabulary surrounding them, because we've found when we talk about all these aspects of GPAs and credits, we use all kinds of vocabulary to get the same stuff. Um, and it makes the discussion hell. So I thought I'd also make sure that you guys can see some of the agreements we've made on how we might talk about these things, just so that as especially new institutions are looking at their own systems and seeing, oh, how do we relate to this? We have some common terms to use to make sure that we're capturing the same thing. So learning result calculations is kind of that uh, abstract term we use to refer to GPAs, credit totals, or different calculations of learning results with learning units. See, did I just completely abstract all that? So it's taking the course grades and getting GPAs. It's taking um, your course credits and coming up with cumulative credit totals. So the first major class is credit hours. Um, that's obviously, you know, I think it's officially student hours if you use the Carnegie model. Um, but there are various ways in which uh, accumulation of credit hours is determined. Um, you know, so we have semester, oh, the semester credit hours. So we know you were in 15 credits this semester. That's one type of calculation. You're going to have cumulative ones, which obviously are going to be all the credits that you've taken at an institution. Um, you could have sub ones, which are, I've seen people do uh, point in time credit calculations. So they want to, oh, what's the total number of credits you've taken since you've been my major? And okay, we got to calculate that. So that's going to be a point in time one. But there's just different buckets of figuring out a uh, numerical quantity of credits. And of course, we also have grade point averages. Um, so these are the ways in which we commonly try to make you know, some aggregate decisions on quality, usually weighted quality, which is why we use a grade point model for that. So that's typically taking the grade points that you've earned in a course. Grade points are typically based on a numerical value given to a letter grade or whatever kind of mark you do. And that's multiplied by the weight of the course in terms of the credits that it has, the student hours involved with it, and to get a kind of numerical value out of that. And that's, of course, then divided by the corresponding credits taken. Um, so what becomes those buckets of how many great points you pull together and the credits related to it is going to depend on the bucketizing of what you're trying to do against semester, cumulative, blah, blah, blah. So those are the two major classes. Um, we also have other classes of learning result calculations, which are kind of different but fit within the abstraction of calculation. And that deals with rankings. That we is a, is a calculation. <laughs> you like that one? 
I'm looking at Bob now. <laughs> and then we have uh, commencement and graduation honors, which are actually somewhat complex calculations that we do. Um, when I talk about those, I'm talking about like summa, magna, cum. And uh, you know, rankings are usually pretty standard to figure out. Um, figuring out commencement honors, many institutions use more complex means to do that in ways to try to normalize across a year. Um, I think most of us, well, I think for semester schools, our spring semester tends to have the highest GPA upon graduation, and our summer term has the lowest GPA, and the fall term is right in the middle. Not that I'm saying one group is smarter than the other, but their GPAs are certainly dramatically different. Um, so I think like many institutions, we kind of normalize to have a standard across the year so that a student who graduates in the summer can't get magna when they would never even come close to it against the spring class. So this gets into some terminology. Um, we'll go through some labels. So these are talking about the credit accumulation. So one is the cumulative units attempted. So this is typically talking about the count of units which a student enrolled at the institution natively. Um, this is important to throw out there because Maryland was awful at using that word attempted in just a blah way. Because our attempted just means, oh, it's the number of credits being used in GPA calculation. Oh, that's confusing, isn't it? So we tried to normalize these terms. This is just about the things that you've attempted. Um, and the way that it's kind of different than the next one, earned, is that earned is talking about the count of things you've successfully completed. I mean, you've earned credit. You've completed some level of aptitude to actually get the credits involved with that course. Attempted can mean an F. If you get an F in a course, that's part of your attempted credit. You attempted the course. You weren't successful in it, but it's still credit. Um, we have term units attempted and term units earned. So obviously, as opposed to the cumulative, which is everything you've done, terms focusing in on a particular period of time. It may be a semester for you, it might be a session, it might be a term. You know. We also have the concept of total units earned, and this was a term we chose to use for institutions that take the transfer units and then add that to your earned native units and come up with a total. Maryland does this as well. Um, so that's what we call total units earned when those come up. And just so you know what we're using, the transfer units accepted is the term we've used for those transfer courses that have been brought in. Grade point averages, um, some similar permutations. Um, we've got our cumulative GPA units, and that's really talking about the count of units used to calculate a cumulative GPA. So this gets a little bit of what Maryland had been calling its attempted. So these are just those things that are part of your GPA. So for example, at Maryland, we've got a pass-fail grading method. So if you pass it, it has no impact on your GPA. If you fail it, yeah, it has an impact on your GPA. So when you have a P grade, a P grade and its credits don't figure into your cumulative GPA unit because that P grade and those credits associated with it are not being used in terms of that averaging process. So obviously linked with that are going to be your grade points. So we call them cumulative grade points. So these will be all the grade points that you accumulated to help make up that GPA equation. Um, and then, of course, cumulative grade point average is the full equation, which comes to that using the cumulative bucket. And we have the same aspect over term. So again, you've got your term GPA units, grade points, and then you use those to come up with your grade point average. We also have the concept of a program cumulative grade point average. Um, where it's, again, it's a GPA, but it's only using courses that were used for the program, which can be a bit of a, a nebulous area. Um, I know for Maryland it has been for a couple reasons. One, I have different departments that consider major GPAs to be different kinds of things. Some just say, oh, it's just give me the GPA of all the courses with this type of prefix on it or subject code. That, that's what I call a major GPA. When I think when we're trying to be more discreet about it, we're really talking about courses used to satisfy the requirements of the program. From a registrar perspective, that can be a little tough, though, because that is a, that's not a static GPA. That is a completely um, morphing GPA, because as we know, the courses you choose to use to fill your, fulfill your requirements can change at a whim. If you had you needed to complete two of ten courses to complete that particular program requirement and you took four, 
Well, you could use any of those four to do it. You may have had one course with an A, one with a B, one with a C. Um, you know, depending on which courses you determine will fulfill that requirement will change how your program GPA would look. So there's some interesting aspects to looking at major GPAs. So the last couple things to talk about, um, these are just some issues that we had to kind of play through. One is the idea of transfer credit versus native credit. So obviously native credit is the work you've done at the institution. You know, I, the University of Maryland, I have a series of learning experiences here in my inventory. You come and take them. Uh, great, that's the native work. Um, transfer credit and other elements of that deal with work you've done at other institutions. You've engaged in somebody else's learning experience of their inventory, and I'm simply aware of that. I then, as an institution, make a decision about which of those I choose to recognize in determining how I grant my credential to you. I mean, that's kind of your transfer credit versus native credit. Um, but there's also different aspects in which institutions manage transfer credit. So there's two kind of models, um, and different institutions do it different ways, and actually Maryland does it both ways. Um, and one is about how you manage the raw credit from another institution and how you then apply it to your own um, record at your institution. So for our like undergraduates, I'll show you one extreme. For all undergraduate students at the University of Maryland, when you send us your transcripts, we take every single course you've taken and we build it into the system and codify it and it's on you. It's raw stuff. The only thing we do to make it, I suppose, a medium rare, not totally raw, is, you know, we do normalize your credits. You know, if you came from, a, 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 say, a unit system school and you're coming to a semester, um, or from a quarter system school and to a semester, we're going to switch your three credits to a 2.67. We'll make that adjustment and we'll, you know, normalize grades a little bit. So if you come from a school that uses freaky, oh, I hope nobody uses these, the A, B grades and, oh, you have an A, B and a B, C. Like, okay, we'll convert that to a B minus and a this, that, and the other. So we'll do those kinds of conversions. Or you'll get your Sarah Lawrence transcript and read the, the paragraph and go, I don't know, paragraph of that looks like they hated the student, make it a D, I don't know. So I mean, you've got to make those little tweaks to, you know, normalize that. But that's it. Otherwise, it's the raw stuff. It's what the course was called. It was what the course title was, what numbering system used. That's all being stored raw in the system. Then for us, what we do is we then indicate which of those we're going to apply to the student's actual undergraduate program here. And we'll mark those in a way and pull them over either as blank credits, meaning it's unsubject matter credits, or we'll actually have equivalencies that will indicate how they relate to our actual courses here when being applied. That's one model. Um, the other model, which our graduate school uses, which I know other schools use as well, is you don't bother documenting and recording all of their transfer work. So at our graduate level, if they decide to take two courses from another institution to apply to your graduate program, say you're getting a master's degree, then all they care about is your, you know, your transcript's been scanned, it's sitting in some image document library, and they'll find the two courses and we'll just build those two courses and they are completely applied to your record. So those are kind of two ways to play with it. And uh, I think we recognize for a call we've got to be able to handle both scenarios. The other aspect to play with is a little bit, we had talked through official and unofficial transcripts. Again, this became terms that were kind of important when talking through academic record in the beginning for us to try to separate ourselves from, to recognize that these are documents. These are not the academic record. They're simply document views. Um, I shouldn't say just all documents. Sometimes they're views of a slice of the academic record. Um, official is often what's used to send to external bodies. Um, so we typically make that as light as possible and show just the real key data. Like for instance, ACRO doesn't recommend you indicate probation on an official transcript. You know, you don't want to hurt a student when you're sending a transcript to the graduate program that they're going to be part of. Um, but your unofficial transcript are typically things, we sometimes call them advising transcripts, it's like your unofficial one. It's got a lot more data to it. Um, it's going to have all the transfer work you've ever done so everybody can see what that is and see how it comes through. It's going to have all of your negative actions all over it because it's being used for advising, it's being used for the student's purpose. Um, and you're not going to send it to anybody. We show cancellations on there. For withdrawals, you saw in our old record when you withdraw, we don't show the courses you were in. On our unofficial transcript, we show everything you were in at the point of withdrawal. So it's just certain differences. And different campuses will have different ways in which they slice that up. So, 
academic record, as you can see, has moved along a bit, but it's still not completely mature. Um, you know, it's, it's past the alien phase. It's now starting to look cute, but it's still, the bones are a little in, eh, a little holding top of the head still. So there's still some work to be done as we continue to move forward with academic record. Um, I think the processes have come along quite well. The terminology is getting better, but there's still some work to do to clean up some of the terminology to make it a little clearer. Um, oh yeah. All done. Any questions? I, I should have stopped at some point to make people ask things, but I have any questions or? Um, Call finishing on a picture, picture of a. Call finishing on a picture of a very cute baby. Yes, yes. I, I thought I was putting my own picture up there as a baby, but uh, I don't think I was cute as that. So just to follow up on something that, that Dan said, I, I think academic record, um, I mean, I just to emphasize what he said, that the concept of academic record and what needs to get stored and, um, and when it gets access, you know, that, it's going to be a continually evolving um, work to understand that as we move through all the different areas of functionality and enrollment, you know, constantly asking the question of, of how does this impact the record? How does this particular process interact with the academic record? Which pieces of it, you know, when you register for a course, which pieces go to the academic record when? Um, you know, same thing with program enrollment and program assessments and you know, graduation, you know, understanding, continually understanding what, how those processes interact with the academic record and what data need to be available on the academic record and when. Because it's going to be a continual work in progress. So, it's a little squishy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think we'll see the boundaries better as registration matures, program enrollment mm -hmm. matures, as these things mature, academic record will start to fill in appropriately. Yep. So Hugh, did you want to just take me over? Is that what you're trying to do? No, I'm asking if you'll keep sharing from your end, Dan. Sure. Can BC ask a quick question about the student record? Yeah, Hello? go ahead. I, quick question. I hear you. What ought to be given to um, handling kind of the graduate student record and or uh, kind of dual degrees? It seems like kind of most of what you've been talking about has been very oriented towards undergraduate students. Or are you thinking mm -hmm. about it on text of graduate students as well? We're thinking about both, but could you state your question? I'm not sure I, I'm not sure if I understood your point on the, the first part of your question. particularly in terms of progress towards degree for graduate students? Comprehensive. Mm -hmm. like comprehensive exams, a thesis, things along those lines. Oh, certainly, certainly. Yeah, those, that's a good question. Um, yes, those are considered part of the academic record. Um, the reason why I think at this point they're not showing up at the surface as clearly as other things is because those, um, we didn't deliver those in curriculum management, but those were part designed as part of curriculum management. And that's um, when you talk about thesis and dissertation, those are things that in quality student we classified as projects. Um, and we haven't delivered those yet. So we haven't necessarily done a lot of work on trying to build that out, obviously, uh, at this level. Um, but in terms of the big picture of KS, those are absolutely part of it. And when you say comps, yeah, those what we were thinking of um, in a test type of clue. So because we have course clues, we have program clues, canonical learning units, I'm sorry, I'm using jargon. Um, one that was always there was the test clue. And the test clue wasn't really so much about SATs, because that's, you know, that's external. It was about what are the types of learning experiences that you might classify as a test or exam that is managed by the institution and documented within the record. And the comps is a brilliant example of what um, kind of uh, the idea of a test clue is in quality. Answer your question. Well, how about how about the dual degree example um, in terms of potentially tracking a student who's you know enrolled in two different degrees and taking courses between two different schools? How would you how would you handle kind of tracking that type of information at the student record level? So when you say dual degrees, are you thinking the like bachelor, master's combined programs? 
you know, like a JDMBA type of example. Right, some, some, courses the might count towards both, some courses might count towards both degrees, with some courses would only count towards one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have more thinking to do on that. We have thought about it in a couple different venues. Um, one, we've thought about it a bit in terms of some of our learning result calculation work and recognizing as we put courses together, often with these kinds of programs that traverse big parts, like your graduate or professional versus your undergraduate, we have to split out courses to say which apply to which uniquely. Or if they're going to dual count, it's something deliberately done to make sure we know how that operation is working. Um, I think, uh, if, I, if I can interrupt, I think that's really more of a program assessment issue. I think we're really dealing with that more at the level of program assessment and degree audit as opposed to the academic record per se. Because um, that's the academic, the, what, I think what you're getting at is, you know, which programs consume which courses is probably more likely of the audit process than, than the record that's storing that information. But there's probably definitely some interaction, but I think, I think that probably happens more at the, at the degree audit place. Well, I, I would... Feel free to disagree with me, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it gets to the core record issues, I mean, right now I have programs that run like that, and yes, I use the academic record as means to um, indicate which of those courses is being applied to which big order program, um, and differently than, say, a degree audit, which gets into a much more granular perspective of things, and which graduate programs sometimes have difficult difficult utilizing. But, um, but I mean, I think you have some good points, Carol, in terms of where program audit hits with that. But I also think there's probably an atomic piece of being able to indicate these types of things. Um, so it's early stages to answer your question. There's also a factor that those types of programs were also discussed in the curriculum management part of um, the first module of the project, and we didn't wind up moving forward with those and delivering that functionality just due to time and scope issues. Um, but it is something that is still a hole in curriculum management. Curriculum management cannot support dual programs right now that traverse those credential types. So, an area for enhancement. <laughs> I, I don't know if I heard that. And it's Steve. Can I jump in on one other comment on that? Please do. One of the things we've done is we've defined the differences between double majors and two con, uh, concurrent degrees with dual degree programs. And so dual degree programs, once curriculum management can handle it, are actually a single program that yields the two credentials at the same time. And thereby, you will be able to do things like calculate program GPAs, which will be appropriate to the JD MBA, for example. Cool. Any other questions? Good question. Thank you for now.